pretty soon. Aha. Uh -huh. I think this is now, right, gentlemen? Yeah. Are we on show business on stage, doggone? It is time, stargazers and astro freaks, for the SBAU Astro Hour. It's a one hour vlog or podcast if you're only listening. We do live every Monday morning, 11 to noon, for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, your South Central Coast Longtime Telescope and Astrophysics Club, where Berkeley's Alexei Filipenko got his start back in 1970. I'm your host, Ron Heron, Vice President of the club. Introduce you to the rest of them in a moment. I do learn a lot from these guys, and I call them the Brain Trust. And you can watch us live on YouTube or even call us up past programs. We've done 162 already. This will be episode 163. Uh, for April 1 through the 7th, 2024 of the Astro Hour, come to our first Friday meetings, except it's the second Friday this month of April 2024. Everything's turned around. I'm going to have a great speaker. Dr. Carey will talk about the race for intelligent life in the universe, since he hasn't found any here, as I said before. And you can check us out on sbau.org. You can join us a week from today when we won't have this program. We'll postpone for another week, but we'll be watching the partial eclipse together, hopefully with a sunny sky out at Camino Real Marketplace. And the star party gets moved up to this coming weekend before the uh, eclipse. And that's following our, uh, I guess, afternoon board meeting, our planning association. Uh, let me run down what we're talking about today. The moon's going down. Perfect time for some NGCs up there. We're going to check them out in the sky. The Devil's Comet approaching perihelion. My own daughter sent me a picture, and she didn't know about the Devil's Comet. I got to tell her we've been talking about it for weeks. Good old 12P, Hans Brooks. A lot of your favorite planets will light up in the morning uh, sky in April before dawn this first week. Which way is the Cassiopeia of W? Is it an M or is it a W? We're going to track another asteroid this time through Boatus, the herdsman. And we're going to see a sky map of some voids and superclusters. You won't believe it's all within 500 million light years of us. Whoa. And some long forgotten, but uh, we're going to honor some nearly forgotten, but definitely honorable early lady astro uh, our astronomers. Started to call them astro, astro, astronauts. Uh, we're going back to 800. Uh, uh, 143 years to Harvard. And also, uh, this just in, Jerry, Chuck, Tim, Tom, and Bruce, and the two Pats are going to be selling all their telescopes at a special yard sale. Some of them given away free. This will be in Tom Totten's driveway this coming Saturday. Uh, they're calling it the Silly Solar Eclipse Sell-Off. Some great deals. Rather than take that $4,000 unit to the dump, they're just going to sell it. $12.95, I think you're asking for it, isn't it, Chuck? Yeah, yeah. Discount, <laughs> special for April 1st. Oh, wait a minute. Is it April? Oh, that's misinformation I was handed. Well, let's go to the silly st Oh, let me introduce everybody. My God. <laughs> First and foremost, Jerry Wilson's in control, beloved president, our captain. Hello. And he has uh, been in office for... A little longer than I have by about a year. Pat Forge is his wife. Chuck McPartland is our outstanding outreach coordinator. Credible man in charge of just about all the events. Pat is his wife. She's merchandise manager and also treasurer. We have Tom Whittemore, whose wife is Maureen. Tom spent years at the beloved, um, I guess, uh, what he had of his own science lab out at Westmont College. And he edits our newsletter. Bruce Murdoch was on board early this morning. There he is, or early with us. He's married to Bonnie, happens to be president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. And Tim Crawford is not on board. Does he call in and say he's not going to He's join He's us? tracking down some parcel that he got from overseas, but he can't seem to find which post office it's at. <laughs> okay. Well, do you know of anybody in the club that is moving inland to, to the east to catch the full eclipse? Oh, yeah. Bunch well, of yeah. Them. Well, well, I mean, Most of the club. You, won't yeah. be able to get a, you probably wouldn't be able to get a hotel room this late, believe it or not, a week ahead. However, now that I've done the headlines um, and I've introduced everybody, let's go to the silly stuff. <laughs> I like this one. Man's having his argument with a microwave oven, which I think was built with some AI. He says, no, I don't want to play chess. I just want you to reheat the damn lasagna. I have that happen with me all the time. Dry my uh -huh. noodle in there, though. 
Here is a rescue on the moon by an AI robot, something that fell over. Is that the one that we just launched? This, this is, is a, slim. Yeah, slim. It's, it's uh, called upside slim? down. There's its, there's its landing motor on the top. And this and, uh, this cartoon character is from Wallace and Gromit. Right. We went skiing on the moon. Yeah, went skiing on the moon. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. So that's the one that uh, set by a private company on board what Elon SpaceX. No, this or, is but... this is the Japanese lander. Yeah. Oh, the Japanese! It but then it fell over just like ours did. Yeah, it did it first. Oh, it yeah. did. It, and so, <laughs> neither of them are operable. This one is Slim yeah. is still operating. Is that right? Well, they got to have their uh, solar panels facing, you know, where. Okay. Apparently enough of them are. Oh, I keep wondering if that happened. You know, you fall us land on a moon rock. Throw us another one there. These are the silly science cartoons. And hopefully this isn't what happens a week from today. My God, the sun says to the cloud, happy eclipse to me. And cloud goes, that's today. And then he pees on us. <laughs> as he has this past weekend. That was fun. Some possibilities. This is not as funny as it is uh, eye-opening and thought-provoking. These could be lines, if you want, from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or the late Carl Sagan. Uh -huh. uh, the one view of the universe, the cosmos, the universe is bigger than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I think Carl said things like this. The universe is smaller than you can imagine. And then here is what I call the um, malarkey of milk toast virgin. The universe is beyond what can be imagined. Oh, I'm sure somebody can come up with an imagine. Now, here's the poor astronaut left behind on the moon. There's a message left. And <laughs> uh, it's, dear Henry, where the heck were you? We waited and waited, but finally decided. Sorry, buddy. And he texts back, I had to go, damn it. I was over behind a crater <laughs> and uh, almost killed myself. I unzipped my uh, spacesuit pants. Here's an ancient NASA program <clears throat> uh, floundering and having problems. The king asks <laughs> the field general, so how's the space program coming today? And they're sitting on <clears throat> the uh, big sling mechanism of the catapult as the warrior astronaut. And here's yes. previous astronauts. Oh, I didn't see those guys. <laughs> Tried to orbit the castle. That's progress. Yeah. Yeah, that's progress. There's hey, there's oh, Tim. Tim. Hello, it, Tim. It I made it. <laughs> you made it, but I, I didn't get announced. I didn't. I didn't announce you. Here's the peanuts shot of the day. Good old Charlie Brown and Charles Schultz. <laughs> I, uh, I just love this. I love yeah. this. Can you increase the size a little, so I don't have to read my squiggly writing? Maybe I can get it. They're out sitting watching the moon, the full moon. There's Charlie Brown with uh, his dog Snoopy, and I guess that's Linus. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This without his blanket. Beautiful, ain't it, Linus? Yes, Charlie, but something seems strange. And they go check it out. And I guess Linus looks in the book and says, you know, when the earth was young and the moon was first formed, moon was only about 15,000 miles from the earth. So over a period of millions of years, the moon has been moving away from the earth at a rate of about, oh, five feet every hundred years. <laughs> He finally says, you know, I thought it looked a little further away than <laughs> that's true. What is it? A few centimeters a, a year? So about and an inch a year. How much is it a year? About an inch. Mm -hmm. An yeah. inch, it goes further. Somehow about two and a half centimeters. Yeah, and what's the difference is... between the uh, the two axes of the ellipse that it, it goes around? It goes I in and out, I... too. All right, here's another astronaut fresh out of the limb doing the same thing most of us do when we walk into a room to do something and stop and go, wait a minute. Now, what the hell did I come in here for again? <laughs> you know, the, um, they're, they're thinking of implementing a uh, GPS system for elderly people. It not only tells you where to go, it reminds you why you went there. <laughs> <laughs> They'll make a fortune. It even happened yeah. when I was younger. Okay. Uh, I'll, you I'll take one. <laughs> you said about 10 things, so which ones didn't get, uh, I guess they were all pretty much covered. Yep, it's all there. Happy eclipse to us. So we're all going to join with our machines mounted out at Camino Real, and the folks are going to be given, what's the deal, Chuck, on uh, the, the lenses, the glasses? We have some? 
Uh, no, the muse we, we're not going to compete with the museum. The muse museum is going to be selling them at the event to uh, benefit astronomy programs. But there's no event at the museum. It's all going to be out at Camino Real Marketplace. That's correct. Through us. Yes. Okay. Well, their latest notice has uh, lots of astronomy, even I yep. think a downtown in the bar there, you know. Okay. What are we going to talk about here? Going up to Casio? Pia? No, not this is not Cassiopeia. This is the tail end of the Big Dipper up here. Uh -huh. And it's a tail of three galaxies. NGC 5907, 5866, and M101. There is um, a speculation on which one of the M's. Oh, M Messier M102 doesn't make sense. So people are speculating that one of these is actually M102, but that's among a, a set of, of uh, speculations. But this is a couple of very famous um, for amateurs um, um, galaxies. One is called the spindle and one is called the splinter. So the splinter is 5907 up here. The spindle is right next to it. And it's hard to confuse the shape of these two galaxies, as you'll see in a minute, with uh, M101, which is a face-on spiral, and these are edge-on spirals. Hmm. So this is the spindle, or is this a splinter? This is the splitter. You think it'll be the size of our galaxy, just edge-on, though? Roughly. Is it? Okay, so about 100,000 light years across. So this shows a lot of dust along the, and when you look at John at it, you get a lot of dust. These are not regions that lack stars. These are regions where the, the stars are being obscured by dust. And that's what causes the dark portions of our Milky Way. When you look up at night, it looks like there's holes in the Milky Way. It's not. It's large clouds of dark dust that obscure the, the cloud, star clouds behind them. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. That's the coal sack nebula, huh? That's one of them. Now, this is the other edge on galaxy. It's called the uh, um, spindle. spindle. No, this is the spindle. Spindle. Okay. Like on a right. spindle. Oh, what am I yeah. Like on a spinning wheel grandma used to use. This is M102, Tim, the, when you're doing the Messier marathon. Oh, okay. Hmm. So um, this is a nearly edge-on galaxy, obviously. You can see a very crisp um, cloud of dust obscuring the, the central portion of it. And um, there's a central reddish bulge. The colors kind of fade here on my screen, but on my iPad, they're really more vivid. But this is a reddish bulge in the center that shows the, the, where any black hole would be. Uh, the the uh, disk of stars itself is blue. That kind of fades to a white blue here on this screen. So um, well, it's blue at the edges. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and then we have a halo that covers uh, that goes around the whole thing. So there are. Um, this this is the region where their yeah. globular clusters would be located in the halo yeah. out here. But this, Jerry, fake glow, can, this fake glow yeah. is all stars. Yeah. Tim, get Tom. I just, yeah, you can see there's a lot of very distant galaxies in this uh, image. Yes. Tons there's of one back there, back there. Yeah. These galaxies frequently occur in clusters. Now they're there. There's at least a dozen and probably double that in the background. Yeah. That's quite a nice image. Well, can I ask my stupid question of the week, gentlemen? Go ahead. At the risk of uh, treading into a possible whole different topic for talking points, does science know why galaxies rotate, why they start rotating? Is that similar to hurricanes and the Coriolis effect on? No, no, it's similar to it's similar to how you get the rings of Saturn and you get, uh, you know, our solar system. It's conservation of angular momentum when they when they collapse down. <laughs> I, well, I I have trouble understanding it. It would seem to me if all that gas and dust coalesces into things, why don't they just collapse together and become a black hole? Do you suppose that they're, happens they're, sometimes? They're trying. 
Yeah. Each one of them has its own momentum, which isn't necessary. The vector that it describes that isn't pointing toward the middle of the galaxy. It's pointing like scans, so it makes it go around. Let's suppose, what, what? let's suppose that you were a dust grain and you're okay. out in the void of, you're a dust grain and you're out oh. in void of space with all your dust grain buddies and you're <laughs> all moving in different directions. Okay. There's going to be, you're going to take a vote on which direction you're all going to end up in. And that vote is actually realized by collisions. And whichever collision, the net collision is, after yeah. a lot of collisions, the net motion is going to win out. And you're all going to have, you're all going to share the momentum in one direction, one preferred direction, if there is one. Some of those dust grains will be turned around. and Some of them will be turned around. They're going to smash into each other. Um, but it's through this friction that they generalize their motion. They all get jostled by the crowd around them. And so they pick up when there's a large crowd running toward the subway station and you don't want to go to the subway station, but you bump into everybody and you sort of get carried along. That's what happens. So they all average to a certain thing. Um, either one way or the other, or no way. It's very rare to have no way, but That's you get that. And so a large object in three dimensions, say a glob of dust, will eventually pick up one particular preferential rotation axis. And then gravity will pull them all together. All the time, gravity is pulling them together. But in the direction where the angular momentum goes, now that you've defined an angular momentum, things are rotating at the equator in a circle around that, they won't collapse. The stuff at the poles will collapse. So a big glob now becomes a rotating disk. Those big, those big non-spiral galaxies that are called, what, ellipses, ellipticals? Yeah. That, do they rotate? They have all sorts of crazy motion in them. Um, they do rotate, but they are the result of a collision, sort of their... Um, their Animals. large structure has been disrupted by the proximity to other large structures. So, so they basically they're like you've mix mastered the cloud again, and they will eventually, yeah. if given enough time, they will collapse down like this. Right, Jerry. Are there any galaxies that don't rotate? I don't know, but I don't think so. That'd be unusual. Called, that'd, that'd be, be called black unusual. holes. They'd be called black no, holes. Black, no, black, black holes, holes rotate like hell. Yeah. Wow. So the ellipticals so have here, no arms. Here is the, okay. Here's the third galaxy, M101. Yeah, so beauty. this is face on. Mm -hmm. And when you look, if you look at it from the side, from 90 degrees away, it will look like one of those two galaxies. It'll be all flat and spindly, and there'll be a big dust lane down the middle of it. Well, look at M81 and M82. Yeah. Hmm. And this is the one that had the supernova just a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And this is a popular one with amateurs to photograph. Yeah. Although I think this is a... Um, that looks Hubble-ish. Yeah. 51 a, individual Hubble exposures. Right. Exactly how I see it in my 8-inch. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tim, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I saw this was at Lassen, Mount Lassen, and the 18-inch was kind of like a... Uh, a first run for that 18 inch telescope I built. It was really beautiful. Of course, not like this, but it's yeah. very pretty. I have, tr I actually have trouble seeing it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's big. And, and, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The arms, surface really brightness. the arms come out in an 18 inch. Yeah. Boy, your 18 is a nice scope, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Well, do they ever classify rotating galaxies by the number of arms? They do they, try to count the number of arms, but you can see how ambiguous that is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can see some of them only have two, and some don't have a bar, but we have a bar and we have four arms, and, but you, we're in between one, aren't we? We're in a little spur. That, that well, People argue that. Ryan, yeah. spur. Here's an arm that breaks up into several different spurs and then comes right. back together. Oh. Yeah. These are dynamical mm -hmm. effects of the, of the crowd trying to move through a traffic jam. <laughs> and Ron, Ron, the older gravitation. This also rotates in the opposite direction as does our Milky Way. 
well, wait a minute. Don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, did you have something you were saying? Well, I was just going to mention, Iran, you notice that the, you know, again, some of this is susceptible to how one chooses colors, you know, in their images, but the older stars are towards the uh, middle and you can see a lot of blue sections out in the arms far away from the core. And those, those are called uh, H2 regions where brand new stars are being born. But now the, the darker regions in between the arms, obviously there's less stars there, right? Oh, it could be occlusion by uh, gas. Yeah. You, know, you just can't. could be gas clouds mm -hmm. or dark nebulas. Okay. And they could yeah, be voids. The high lines are, I think, are uh, uh, dust, carbon. Yeah. In here, the, the dark lines are definitely dust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the middle. Out here, I think it's uh, absence of stars, but you can see there is a faint haze. So there's a lot of stars out here. They're just not um, mm -hmm. concentrated. Mm. So anyway, now moving on to our other great night, late night um, situation here in Aries the Ram. Mm. This is not late Jupiter. night. What's that? <laughs> no, no, this, this is not is late night. This is very early. Another Freudian slip. Yeah, this is about 20 minutes after sunset. Now, I do not show a, um, a horizon here in these things. Mm -hmm. I prefer just to show the, the, the map. But this yeah. is the constellation of Aries. This is the star ha Hamel. Yeah, all Hamel. And if you put Hamel in the center of your field of view this week in, in a small yeah. amateur scope, you'll get the comet. <laughs> will be there too. That's right. Yeah. Uh, How many of you guys have seen it? Oh, it's been raining at my place. Yeah, yeah I, I saw it in binoculars with some friends last Monday. Yeah, when we had something of a break. That last yeah, Joe year. and Connie and Pat and Tessa and I went out to Lake Los Carneros and, yeah. and observed it. Yeah, and Joe took that pretty shot of the moon bow, huh? Yeah. Well, that yeah. was the night we failed to observe it, but the next, <laughs> okay, okay, or the following uh, Tuesday night or Monday night, we saw it. Yeah, <laughs> Devil's Comet. This is yeah. a nice amateur photograph mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from James Pierce, Skull Valley, Utah. Uh, nice these place, are, obviously, these are an amateur in China that wow. took a picture between March 6th and March 14th, and it shows the variations of the table, I mean, of the tail. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me at least? I got lost. My light went out. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. I'll, just, I'll just be the voice of Hal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can I see your drawings, Mr. President? Nice drawings, Dave. <laughs> Ron, can you see the picture? Can you see? Yeah, that? I see everything. I just don't know why it went out. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. It went out because your camera's off. Well, let me try the one that's built in here. See if that'll come on. Nope. Just I would just leave things alone. I yeah, will, yeah. or I'll go away. You're right. Okay. So these are variations of the comet. None of them show the the. Uh, explosion and the forking of so you get a double tail that was earlier on that wow. gave it the name of the devil comet but this will be very nice it's around fifth magnitude possibly close to fourth magnitude during the eclipse a week from today mm -hmm. so um look for it only during totality don't pick your binoculars <laughs> and look for it before the uh eclipse is total and if you're looking at the total, if you're there in the total eclipse, uh, why the hell are you looking at a comet? Look at the total eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> we may need a cloud filter out of Camino Real. Oh, the predictions oh, yeah. look decent. I think it's going to be okay. Yeah. The weather. Yeah. I love it. I, th I think we have thunderstorms this Friday, but I, th I think Monday is okay. Yeah. And Saturday for the star party. Oh, great. Okay, good. Now, this might be a confusing diagram <laughs> because I don't put in the horizon. But the horizon in the very early morning, this is the sun. Mm -hmm. The horizon um, just before the sun comes up goes right along here. Yeah. Flat. 
and you can see that Neptune, Venus. Venus is tough now, Jerry. I I was looking for it this morning. Yeah, it's just before the sun comes up. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, tough. Saturn and Mars are much easier. Mm -hmm. So Neptune would be, if Venus is hard, Neptune is going to be, <laughs> it would be even worse. Because that's magnitude seven. Yeah. So, and this is definitely in a bright sky just mm -hmm. before the sun comes up. Yeah. Mm, and Mercury's a crescent. Yeah, Mercury's still in the uh, evening, you know, but yeah. it, you get, getting close to the sun now. Speaking of, <laughs> this is a, a map of Venus um, on the morning of, this is um, April 1, today. Today, in the evening. Yeah. In the evening, right after sunset. So it's a crescent Venus, and you might, if you could find Venus, you, you would probably just be able to tell that it's crescent. You're Mercury, not going to pick Mercury. up Mercury. Mercury, not Venus. Yes. It, yeah, yeah, Venus is uh, is a morning thing. Yeah. You, if you look at v, if you look at Mercury in the evening, mm -hmm. right after sunset, and if you can find it, you're going you can probably just make out that it's a crescent. Yeah. Hmm. You won't be able to spot any of these features. Yeah. It still can be brighter as a crescent because it's on our side of the sun, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I used Mercury and Al Hamel last uh, Monday night to get the comet. Again, I was just using binoculars with a little sky window. So it was real steady. Hmm. You know, we saw it, you know, just a little fuzzball. Bob, um, why, we, why when we looked at, at, at uh, Mercury up at, like at the gun club, did we get the, the reds and blues and it, almost like a kaleidoscope color? That's atmospheric yeah. refraction. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. okay. Okay. Yeah, because we no, showed it at Westmont. Right, Tim. We showed it to folks at Westmont. I just walked yes. down the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Now this is where this is um, from Astronomy Magazine. This is where you have to look on a good uh, horizon mm -hmm. to find Mercury. About forty-five minutes after sunset, looking west. So you need a very good horizon. Yeah. And then Mercury sets very quickly after that. Hmm. This is. Yes, oh, Peter. yeah. Now for us, this is tough because when it's in this W-ish configuration, it's yeah. uh, at lower culmination, so it's behind our mountains. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the uh, northwest, huh, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. Northwest, northeast. Northeast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's Here's rising that. when it's in this. The W is... Um, this here, 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 and here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This line and these two lines are extraneous and are confusing. I haven't found a good way of erasing them in this <laughs> planetarium thing, but they can be very confusing because this W pattern, for my eye, maybe I've looked at it for too many decades, but it just pops out in the sky. Yeah. My Is brother Paul... I was going to say, my brother Paul used to, we, we used to see the W rising in Indianapolis in the Northeast. And yeah. Paul used to tell me that was either Whittemore or Westinghouse. <laughs> <laughs> He's the West, guy that taught me astronomy. It was when it was sent. When it's it was more sent. like an M now, I think, isn't it, Chuck? Yeah, kind what? of off in the in the West. Yeah. Is, is the star above uh, Nobby there? Is it, it, it's, that's, that star, there, is that Tycho's star? No. No. Okay, that's the one that I use to go through the middle of the W. Okay, Tim, I can't hear you. Could you repeat that question? Oh, it was it was where Tycho's star is. Oh, Tycho. Yeah, this Tycho's way up. Star there. is up up here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Right. Oh, wow. okay. But can you tell me was was Cassiopeia an ancient queen? Mythology. Yeah. I don't know if she was really a, there was a real her. Oh, yeah. mythical queen of Ethiopia, right? There's also mother also of Andromeda, and married to Cepheus, huh? Yeah. And this is either a W or a chair. It's her yeah, you can see the chair, but it's on its side, so she comes up sort of on her side, you know, in in the in the fall. Okay. Got See it. the chair in the back is with Rukba, and then the star to the left. I don't think it has a name. 
this one. Australia, yeah. Australia, can, can, I'm, Australia can see this, can't they? I'm sure it has a name. No, they can't. Yeah. yeah. Can Northern I? Australia, maybe. Okay. And Cassiopeia's head is down, is it not? Uh, you know, it's off to the left in this image. Yeah, where, where there's kind of those, a collection of fairly bright stars there to the left, like mid-course. In here? Uh, no, keep going farther left. left. Yeah, further left. Keep going. And right up in there. Go up. Up. Right there. I think that's where your head's supposed to be. Ah, so. Okay. Oh. And then the chair legs are pointing off toward the right. That's right. Yeah. And where the where it says Cassiopeia in blue letters, that's kind of the seat. Of, that's of right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, I that's, mean, people that's of course chair. see different things, but yeah. And at the back I, of the chair, then of course would be then Rukba and that star to the left. Yeah, this the back yeah, this of the Rukba. Yeah. So, used, so when Cassie well, P is at its highest, she's hanging upside down, and that was done right. to embarrass her. Right. I I use that star above uh, Navi, and I go through the center star. And then you go make a right angle with that with uh, 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 what is that rock, uh, uh, rock button? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's how I find four five seven the the mm -hmm. And that little circle, that little yellow circle, dotted circle, is probably and that's probably it. That's probably right it. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Four fifty seven. Well, it could mm -hmm. be four five seven, and it could be the one below it. But I think it, I think you're right. It's just about right there. Yeah, makes a nice right triangle, Tim. It does. Oh yeah, it's a it's a real nice uh, it's a that's a really nice way to to uh, find find that uh, yep. that cluster. It's a good star hop. Now the star for this part of the talk is Eta, mm -hmm. which is actually not part of the constellation, oh. but it's named. Well, it's close to this bar. Yeah, it's in the constellation, mm -hmm. but I mean it's not part of my favorite stick figure. <laughs> so. Oh. Um, this Ada is a double star. Oh. And it's a bright and a dim double star. There you go. Oh, I've got to try to find that thing. Oh, yeah. So nice. it's blue here and orange here, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a bit different in brightness. The, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. It's a third magnitude yellow white star. And alongside of it is an orange red magnitude 7.5 companion well yeah. but we should be able to see that easy oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well it's a red dwarf yeah and eta cassiopeia is the past tense of eta cassiopeia <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Tim. it's, thanks, it's not a ron it's not a red dwarf <laughs> oh it's not no. well, why, why wouldn't they colorize this well, this is whatever their detector said the color was, you know, it, it could well, saturate. The president, president just said when the big one was yellow and the other one was red, why not just color them that? Well, they are, but they're, they're, this one is probably slightly overexposed. Uh -huh. The colors are actually there in the photograph that I captured, but they don't show well on the screen here. Mm -hmm. You know the contrast separation, and Jerry? What's that? Do you happen to know the separation in arc seconds? Are these two? Because that'd be a nice thing if it's pretty wide to show the public. How about yeah. the separation in light weeks or light months or light? Oh no, weeks? just arc seconds. I know, but are they're they separated by thirteen arc seconds. See, that's Ooh. a good. That's a nice refractor double. That's a beautiful yeah. refractor double. So they're orbiting each other, or one's orbiting them. Okay. It's, it's about twice the separation in the. In the uh, Diffraction spikes. That's just our atmosphere, I guess. It's a, these these there, spikes. Yeah. Is that these are these are the secondary spider spikes. Yeah. I know. So that was and a reflection. A, a rainbow in them. What's what are you saying? Well, that's that's part of the diffraction effect too, as you get kind yeah, of yeah, exactly. Rainbow. That's the diffraction of our atmosphere, right? Probably. Um, Mm, I don't know. Don't know, I don't know about that. that. Yeah, you're right. It's part of the diffraction effect of the telescope. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. Definitely scattered light. <clears throat> the thing I is know so when I when I put light scattered all around in there. When I when I put my uh, 
um, Botanov mask on to focus uh -huh. uh, with the Malin cam, which is color, I get quite a rainbow effect in the spikes. So okay. uh -huh. just the plain old diffraction grading can give you that. And that's similar to what the spikes would be from the uh, spider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Tim, memorize this one. That'd be a real nice uh, outreach. Yeah, I out. think we ought to. Uh, Eta Cassiopeia. Yeah, Eta Cassiopeia. Yeah. At PA, okay. Mm -hmm. well, I, when the spider in the scope has the curved veins rather than the straight veins, you just see a a diffuse uh, diffraction pattern? You, you don't like see any diffraction yeah. pattern. It's spread uniformly over the entire background. Yeah, you won't see it. it is Jeremy definitely. made one of those little hoop. Uh, spiders and it, it it eliminates it altogether. Right. Asteroid Herculina now in Boatus the herdsman. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And I pronounce Why don't telescopes, more telescopes have the curved uh, spiders then. The purists don't like that because if you want to look, for example, if you want to look at a planetary system, something that needs real high magnification of uh -huh. real fine um, high spatial frequencies, they want a Newtonian or something with central veins in it so that the diffraction spikes are across and then they rotate the telescope so that the object they're looking at is uh, at a 45 degree angle from the center of the picture so that they're uh -huh. away from the diffraction spokes. And that's where you get the highest resolution uh, in contrast at the high frequencies. If you have a curved secondary or spider, then you don't get the, the diffraction is spread all over and there's no way to get away from it. And they're probably harder to collimate. It's a, it, there's also uh, the, the idea that if you, if you have any movement, they can bounce. I mean, you have to have a pretty thick little. Yeah, they're springy. There. They're springy. Yeah. And uh, Gary Peterson has one in, in his 10 inch Dobsonian, he has a circular diffraction or spider and it's very hard to get that curvature right and get the thing centered in that because you have to end up bending the the curvature <laughs> slightly to, to get yeah, it to center. Yeah, and then you hope yeah. it stays there yeah because they're not pulled under tension like a uh, cross spider yeah. is yeah. yeah so you get temperature changes moving it too yeah yeah i think i think probably the, why they're so rare yeah <laughs> Well, like so I said, here is the... Jeremy made one in his ten inch, and it was it was uh, he it was a result of a dumpster dive where he found a piece of uh, stainless steel and bent it in a hoop. It was pretty rigid, but boy, it took a Jeremy mm -hmm. to bend it. Yeah. Huh. Herculina is not a uh, dwarf planet. Like so he Jeremy. loosened one of the screws on his spider, and the rest of it flung his secondary out of the tube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. It was it, it was a pretty gnarly uh, piece of piece of iron. But I, I I'm I'm with everybody else. I like the, the the spikes, and I think that that cross spider is. Uh, and I've seen three. I've seen with three veins or three spokes. I've seen mm -hmm. those. I can't remember the company that made those, but. Uh -huh. but but I think the four the four veins are really nice. They just you if know, you have um, if you have three veins, then you will get six um, diffraction spikes. Oh, okay, yeah. I can't remember the company that made those, and they were it was a it was a nice spider. I think Joe had one. But, uh -huh. but the the uh, the collimation is a little bit different than the ones from Astro Systems. Anyway, that's another topic. <laughs> Well, now are we looking okay, at this? Is uh, Arcturus? We're looking at a asteroid, the 532nd asteroid to, to get a name, hmm. Herculina. <laughs> what if it I lost was, my sound um, here? I've lost my sound. Can you guys hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Yeah. Okay, my question is simply are we looking at the uh, orbit uh, in the asteroid belt? No, this is the uh, this is the night sky, and this is right now April first. Herculina will be right here at the April first tick mark on this curve. On the thirtieth of April, it will be over here in the sky. So this okay. is its apparent path in the sky, Ron, but it is right. orbiting out in the asteroid belt. Okay, yes. but this is not representing its orbit. This is its orbit seen from Earth. It's arc of the orbit. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Now this is uh this is for Chuck. Because <laughs> that Arcturus. other one sucked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this shows Arcturus here, 
Mm -hmm. And um, let's see what's what did it uh, Arcturus, Buddhas, and the um, it's near Ada, so way down at the bottom there where the white lettering is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was. Uh, this is the one I wrote in, so it's right near that. Yeah, that's so this is the Greek letter Ada, mm -hmm. so uh, it's heading toward from here to here on the fifth, it will be as close as it's going to get to Ada. The, the constant, the uh, comet's not marked on here, but it's going to be, what is that? Murf, Murfred? Murfred? Oh, yeah. Murfred. Uh -huh. Murfred, yeah. yeah. Part of so, the hockey stick. Part yeah. of the hockey stick with eyes are Arcturus. Mm -hmm. And oh. now the one that makes the little top of the triangle, the bottom of the triangle here, the bottom right mm -hmm. um, is, uh, has an exoplanet. So come down with your cursor just a little. Yeah, that one. That one has an exoplanet. Okay. Hmm. Not that you'll see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can also see the M3 there too, between Ar Arcturus and, and Corcoroli. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this, this up here is the tip, it is the tail end of the handle of the Big Dipper. Oh, okay. And it represents, it's an arc shape and the arc goes around like this and gets you to arc tourist. Mm -hmm. So then you can spike to spica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And arc tourist means guardian of the bear because it follows okay. the bear's tail around. Okay. It was discovered in 1904 by Max Wolf in Heidelberg. And um, he was the one that named it after a mythical Hercules, but given a feminine form to the name which was the custom in 19, oh, the early 1900s where all asteroids were given um, after um, were given feminine names, mostly based on operas. Hmm. So oh, that's really? <laughs> that's and it's going to be magnitude nine at brightest. Uh, that wasn't um, your write up, but I looked it up just to see how bright it was going to be. Okay, good. So you suppose we can find a couple of asteroids named Aida and Carmen up there? I bet oh, you I could. Yeah. <laughs> Depends what his favorite was. There's definitely an Aida, but I don't know about Carmen. Mm -hmm. So this That's is a larger, one of the larger members of the main asteroid belt. It's in the top 20 for size. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the top 10 for uh, mass. And it has been, it's, it hasn't been photographed directly, but its shape has been inferred from photometry. Because as it rotates, you can see the brightness change. And so they'll back out of that deconvolute in a way, the approximate shape. And they decided that this one um, likely had a shape of um, a toaster. <laughs> so this is a possible derived shape for Herculina, the asteroid. Wow. Without the wings. Without the wings, yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we'll find and, uh, interestingly enough, in 1978, Herculina became the first asteroid to be confirmed to have an asteroid moon. Wow. Uh, Got a little companion. Yeah. In 1993, using the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble failed to locate any secondary moon. So it's up in the air whether it really has a moon or not. Yeah. Well, I used to wonder out loud in class, are there moons around moons? And now it's all coming true. Well, moons around moons is a tough thing to do, but um, moons around what? asteroids isn't. Got it. Moons around moons is a variation of the three-body problem, and that's not stable. It's just amazing. We have a big planet the size of us called Venus that doesn't have a moon. We got a dinky one that's been declassified called Pluto that has... What several moons, right? Five. Moons. Five. <laughs> um, Venus has seen a lot more neighbor action, and it's a lot closer to other bodies than Pluto is. And maybe some of its moons have. This is a diagram of the constellation of Hercules, a very famous and easy to find constellation. The um, M13, the globular cluster, is up here. And we are going to look at, what are we going to look at? Kappa, which is way up here. 
the K is Kappa in Greek. Definitely flexing his muscles in this photograph. Yeah. <laughs> Which side of this is 13 on again, Jerry? I think it's on the Zeta side, the other side. Oh, it's over here? I think, yeah. But don't look at that. Way. That depends on which way it is in the sky, yeah. But Whichever it side it's on, it's on one of these long sides, and it's two-thirds of the way to the narrow one. Mm -hmm. I think okay. it's on the longer side of that of, of that keystone. I th and that I think yeah. that, that's the right. I think that's it. Right there, okay. So anyway, that, as you know, this is a wide view of it, this of M13. It's a beautiful star cluster. It's bright. And you can easily see this in even a small telescope. It might look like a fuzzy star, but it and has binoculars. lots of structure to it. Yeah. Yes. Naked eye. You can see right there is a galaxy. Oh, uh, 6207. Yes, yeah, 6207. Uh, there's supposed to be another galaxy more close in, but uh, unless I'm guided to it, I never find it myself. There's one at the very top. Up here right there. is a. Well, that's another sh another one up here, mm -hmm. right on the edge of the field of view. Oh. So, okay. So this is a beautiful structure. Mm -hmm. Now the yeah. reason that we're looking at Kappa is that in the region of Kappa, oh, wow. we have a we have a, a what's called the Hercules Galaxy Cluster. Yeah. The, the globular cluster we just looked at was a star cluster. This is a cluster of galaxies. All the bright objects in here are galaxies. There's a couple in interacting. There's one with a tick to the side, maybe a star close to it. These fuzzy things, these are disks of stars. These are obviously two interacting ones. Um, Man, there's all kinds in there. That's right. It's a, it's a very close... Um, Cluster, it's part of the Virgo supercluster, as we are. And um, this covers a full square degree. Okay. Yeah. And represents about three hours of observation hmm. of the VLT, the very large survey telescope, very large telescope, survey telescope, VST. Could we see any of those in a backyard scope? Uh, with a photograph, you can. I don't think you're going to see it. With these things, you might see it with a like um, Chuck's 18 inch. Oh, okay. It goes. <laughs> yeah, my, my 18. I've seen them in an 18, but uh, probably not that many. Yeah. No. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. There's yeah. several dozen there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And these are all within 500 million light years. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh no, that that's the next picture. Oh, I'm sorry. These, these um, would be within 500 million though. These are more like 50 to 60 million at most. Yeah, they're a lot closer than 500. Okay, this next picture is going to have voids in it as well, isn't it? Yes, this shows beginning to show the large structure of the universe. This is a map of the galaxy clusters mm -hmm. that are near us. We wow. are right here. Mm -hmm. And this is the Gallic, the, the Virgo supercluster is here. And this is the Hercules supercluster up here. It looks like it's right in the same direction, roughly. Oh, wow. It's a very dense one, but it's quite far away. Um, this is the cor Corona Borealis void. For some reason, um, big structures here follow uh, veins like a neural network or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> these were um, fluctuations in something very small. These are quantum fluctuations that suddenly blew up and made this frothy looking void filled structure of our universe. Yeah. Jerry, may I make a comment? Please. Uh, yeah, the, uh, this, this idea was mentioned in Hossenfelder's book, uh, Existential uh, Astrophysics. And uh, there are people who think that this is sort of nutty, but there are people who think that because these structures here look like a neural network, that the universe may think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my my personal feeling is baloney, 
but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, if, no, if, no, if the no, universe no, thinks, no. imagine the distances that these neural nets would have to cross in even speed of light. Yeah, yeah. look at that. My question is: Is the baloney rotating? Yeah, the baloney <laughs> rotating. <laughs> Our last speaker. Nobody knows the answer to that because we don't know what it would rotate with respect to. I guess. This but, yeah, like, there, this there have been a couple of papers about this, Jerry. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bob Berman's speech in early March. If yeah. this is a if this is a a, a neural net yeah. of, like a brain, mm -hmm. uh, the thought process process must be very slow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that that, that was the argument that it probably doesn't think. Mm -hmm. And and the paper that I saw was written by an astrophysicist and um, a medical person. You know, somebody who studies the brain. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting factoid about AI. <clears throat> you know, it uh, camps around, it, it goes, you know, it looks out on the internet to, to find, to get information. Mm -hmm. And it's getting information from other AI stuff and it's killing itself. You know, it's <laughs> getting filled up with garbage. <laughs> Just like well, people who have no critical thinking skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, out, out in those big blank black spots called voids, mm -hmm. we detect we detect some scattered uh, what galaxies, but not individual stars. We don't see anything. No, it's actually more likely to have individual stars than galaxies. It doesn't have large congregations for galaxies to form. Right. There's several structures here that are very big. Like here, we see the sculptor wall, mm -hmm. and that's this thing that goes along like this this straight structure. There's another one back here, the Centaurus wall. Mm -hmm. so they're not mm -hmm. these are clumps but these other ones are drawn out structures very long nearly straight things it's very puzzling yeah looks like but the wall in yellow spiral structure the what well i was just gonna say it looks like the walls are indicated in yellow there's three of them there oh yeah that's right yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the coma uh, over here the coma wall mm -hmm. uh, it looks to me like if you squint it looks kind of like a soccer ball so <laughs> we may be at halftime. I, I, I'm kind of looking. I, I kind of see it as a kind of a spiral structure in a way. I don't see a spiral, but it's supposed to be like web-like fibers. The whole damn universe is just a lattice work, isn't it? it? It's it's like a bunch of soap bubbles, and you're looking yeah. along the surfaces and where they intersect. Mm -hmm. They're quantum fluctuations that were all once inside something very very small, most likely, and then it just became very big. Hmm. Oh. Well, that, that means, okay, let's go salute the ladies here, gentlemen. Oh. It's time. This is a, a group, Astronomy Magazine calls it Pickering's Harem. Mm -hmm. That's, um, uh, what's his name? Char Edward Pickering. He's head mm -hmm. of the college, of Harvard College Observatory. I like his mohawk there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was rather than a, a design statement. I think that was just nature speaking. Yeah. <laughs> so Jerry, just a point here. So some years ago, uh, our family went out to the Harvard Observatory. We got a nice tour of it and everything. And uh, there's a real famous picture that includes Henrietta Leavitt, mm -hmm. where all the women who were called computers were holding hands. So we yes. did that. We did that, and somebody took a picture of us. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask if these were the human computers here, but yeah, yeah. they are. They oh, are. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's, okay. that's the, the women, this the ladies. Is, this is 1881, and Pickering was the, uh, like all heads of uh, institutes, are responsible for doing research and publishing papers. And it just wasn't working out for him with the men and the graduate students he had. And he got mad one day and he said, My maid could do a better job than this. And so actually he hired his maid and she yeah. did do a better job. And she's one of the genius. <laughs> and he eventually fired all the men and he hired 80 women at the observatory. Yeah. Yeah. Because at that time you could legally hire women at uh, a fraction of the cost that men uh, required for white wages. And it turns out they were amazingly productive. They were sharp people. Right. And they made many, many discoveries uh, and logical insight that is the basis today of a lot of our astronomy. Right. Yeah. yeah. For example, um, Wilhelmina Fleming, I don't know which ones of these they are. Yeah, but I that's think she might have been the point. maid, Jerry. I think yeah, Fleming was the maid. the maid. Yeah. Yeah. She's credited with discovering the Horsehead Nebula, 
-hmm. and the classification of stars based on the surface temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt was discovered Cepheid variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. In the Times this morning, Jerry, there's a really fantastic uh, write-up about Henrietta Levitt because she died almost 100 years ago, 1921. It's just beautifully done. Wow. And then there's uh, one uh, Annie Jump Cannon, who we've mm -hmm. talked about before, mm -hmm. who uh, made contributions to the stellar classification system of O, B, A, F, G, K, and M-type stars based on their color. She's also the one that came up with the now non-politically correct mnemonic, <laughs> uh, which is uh, to remember the classifications in order is, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can look up on the internet, there's now at least a dozen replacements, new, new mnemonics that are politically Oh, correct. yeah. Oh, yeah. But well, this is the one I learned in the ninth grade, so that's the one that stuck. Mm -hmm. at, this, at this particular time, we didn't have our Messier objects and NGCs yet. Sure. sure. No, we yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they were just going to get the riffraff around those catalogs. I, I heard yeah. a rumor that Pickering was kind of a, a jerk. Is that right or no? He, he was <laughs> tough. He was really tough. Yeah. I think it depends on your point of view. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, at this time, too, we didn't even know how big the Milky Way was you know, or anything. We didn't know anything. Yeah, or that there was anything but the Milky years of Way. The That's right. The That's right. Was he the one that was the uh, named the Pickering's Triangle? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where is the Harvard Observatory located? On campus or hey, Cambridge? It's it's not too you know it's uh, it's not too far from Harvard College. Oh uh, really? Uh, excuse me, University now, um, but yeah, yeah we, we got a free tour. We got to go upstairs, and I I saw that uh, I think it was a thirteen inch maybe. 13 change refractor. Uh -huh. I think it was 12, but the 12, 13, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we actually went in that uh, observatory and just looked at that. Was the telescope, I think, what's his face used? Um, uh, Jerry, you met him um, in Hawaii for the telescope. spokes of, of the rings of Sarah, Stephen O'Meara. Yeah, yeah. O'Meara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they just Stephen gave the keys when he was a teenager. <laughs> yeah, he told us about that. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't put it up in the mountains like UCSB did theirs, right? There was a time when they built all observatories in convenient places mm -hmm. uh, where the astronomer was living. Now, they did not have a big problem with uh, city lights at that time like we do. But eventually they started, I think the first one to be built away from things to take advantage of a dark sky was in Flagstaff with Lowell. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, Lowell. So, yeah. If, if uh, by the way, there's a really, really good book uh, about Levitt called uh, Levitt's Stars. It, it's really oh. good. It's written by a science writer from the Times, New York Times. Are, are we kind of at the end that I can make a a, a comment about uh, uh, last night? I saw a Nova show late uh, uh, and it, it, it actually had some citizen science in it, Chuck, where the uh -huh. where the. These people went down, I think it was Senegal, and they wanted to see a, a, an asteroid oh, yeah. wink out a star. Yeah. And it went, and it was for the Lucy mission. Yeah. And, yeah. Yuri and Babies it, was was the asteroid. I think this so. sounds right, Chuck. Yeah, I, I saw this Nova too. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was really neat. And they were yeah, talking about that. I think the Lucy's still on a mission to go to the, the next uh asteroid uh is gonna be 2028. And so, you know, Jerry, maybe in the future we can talk a little bit about it. If we can find, if I find any information, I'll send it to you. But there was a neat, that was a neat thing. Mm -hmm. It's I really good. Get, so I was that's almost that's going to be four up. years from now. <laughs> and, yeah. and they've already made a, a couple of discoveries. Like when they turned on their, to test their camera, they found a small asteroid. Mm -hmm. And so they called it Dinkinesh, which mm -hmm. is the Ethiopian or Eritrean term for the Lucy fossil. It means wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then they saw, oh, it has a moon, you know, that was popping out behind it, a much smaller asteroid. And then as they passed by and they, the aspect changed, they took another picture and they could see that the moon was actually a contact binary of two little pieces snuggled up against each other. Oh, yeah. And they ended up naming the moon Salam, which is like Ethiopian for peace, like Salam. Mm -hmm. Well, I was I was thinking you, Chuck, when I was watching this, because 
they were talking all about all these people that had gotten the data and they yeah. so they they got the the shape of the asteroid and yeah that that's what you're in that's what you're doing and i think that yeah. was mark buey of, of southwest research institute or one of those places that that organized that okay yeah it was it was, it was amazing they, they yeah. had a lot of the people down i think it was senegal they a lot of the it, it the, was uh, senegal yeah that's for sure tim they yeah. have a huge uh, inventory or a large inventory of something like 25 uh, 12 inch dobs, uh, yeah. trusted dobs and, yeah. and cameras that have built in GPS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that they, they send out for these campaigns. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was very interesting. Yeah. So that's a tip of the hat to you, Chuck. <laughs> well, I, did, <laughs> I didn't join in. <laughs> yeah. Lots to talk about, gentlemen, and I guess we're not going to be on screen next week. It'll be two weeks before we resume, I guess, the SBAU Astro Hour. Mm -hmm. But for sure, we'll be out at Camino Real. Uh, Chuck, you want to encapsulate real quickly in the next minute exactly how things have changed in the next two weeks, with various meetings and things? Well, the, the normal second Saturday at the museum has been moved to the first Saturday, so that'll be on the 6th. Right. And a normal first Friday meeting has moved to the second Friday, uh, so that'll be the 12th. Um, okay. That's because there's construction at the museum and we won't be able to get into either Fleischmann or Farron. So our meeting, our sit down meeting on the 12th will be in the courtyard gallery, which is right across from the kind of where you enter the museum at the main entrance. Mm -hmm. And that's also where they have a bunch of uh, Hubble and web pictures around the walls. So it'll be yeah. uh, astronomy themed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Those pictures are, are called infinity shots of infinity or something. And we won't have a planetarium show like normal at seven o'clock. So everything will start at seven thirty. Planetarium is also closed for the remodeling. Okay. And Dr. David Carey, you got me his name. Yes. And he's very, very <laughs> anxious. I had to tell him uh, we owe him a trip to the planetarium in the future. But <laughs> gentlemen, uh, I think he knows a little bit about that planetarium. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure he does. You, you all know Dr. Carey. I haven't met yeah. him. Oh yeah. Before. Courtyard, I get the feeling it's outdoors, but it isn't. It, uh, it's no. not open to the it's world. It's inside. Mm -hmm. It's inside. It looks pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, we'll see you then uh, on uh, the screen next Saturday afternoon and then out at Camino Real on Monday morning for the partial eclipse. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. I hope to have my ugly mug on the screen with you 